Uh, first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Heidi, Jen, and Bitten for the opportunity to come here and talk to you today. It's really an honor, and given the talks that I've seen so far, um, hopefully we'll live up to um, live up to this. And hi, I'm Tanner Delanoy. Uh, I'm his daughter. I've been low carb since 2019 and reverse men will put into remission some metabolic health issues as well as migraines. So we're all about the low carb lifestyle and all about understanding addiction and recovery. Um, I'm going to pass back to my dad. So the way we got here today was that back in 2016 I was diagnosed with gout and then in 2019 I was diagnosed with prediabetes. And I'm sure if we were to go around and ask everybody in this room, um, probably everyone here has a story. And so in the beginning, I was struggling a lot to try and find a solution to what was going on with me, and the medical establishment didn't have anything to offer. And it was when I found my way to the ketogenic lifestyle that I was able to reverse my diabetes based on my fasting glucose and A1C, and I put my gout in remission. It was in that process that, that, that I became inspired to try and reach out and help people that were confronted with the same kind of chronic diseases as that I had been and be able to give them help. In terms of my background a little bit, I have a PhD in biochemistry and I'm also a nutrition network uh, coach practitioner. Uh, what we're going to focus on today, first we're going to do the science, and I think the science is really important, and we've heard a lot this morning already about addiction, um, and we've heard the end point about what's happening in the brain, and what we're going to talk about now is perhaps what the evolutionary origin of alcohol and sugar addiction, in, in my way of thinking, actually is. So you're looking at what's called the survival switch. This is fructose metabolism, uh, which we evolved to do about 24 million years ago. And that was followed by alcohol 10 to 15 million years ago. The alcohol pathway evolved right on top of this pathway. Most likely, the enzyme that was influenced by, uh, by evolution that ties these two pathways together, the fructose metabolism and the alcohol metabolism, was aldose reductase. Now, uh, this work comes primarily from Richard Johnson, who's literally spent decades working on this and, um, and has published extensively somewhere over 700 publications. To activate the switch requires fructose in the form of sugar, I'll get to that in a second, hyperglycemia, and alcohol. I call these three things the deadly triad because they all activate this pathway. Fructose, when it arrives at the liver, uh, is um, quantitatively moved into the liver. There's no feedback mechanisms. And then the fructose is processed to fructose 1-phosphate. The ATP pools in the, in, the, in the liver at that point are completely decimated along with the phosphate pools. And then inversely, you have an acute sudden rise in intracellular uric acid, which is a signaling molecule that activates systemic inflammation on a, a four different levels, is reaching out and driving insulin resistance. Um, oh, okay, sorry, I lost track. Um, not feeling really well today. All right, so we have the systemic inflammation, we have disruption of the nitric oxide pathways, and we have new fat accumulation. So when this switch is activated, it completely reprograms the liver and any of the other tissues that actively metabolize fructose into storing fat and topping off glycogen stores. This perhaps is also the driving factor of type 2 diabetes, obesity with comorbidities, and cardiovascular disease. Whoops, back one. All right, so very, very quickly. Um, the fructose origin is sugar. 
So it's important for a moment to talk about that quickly. So table sugar is 50% fructose by mass. High fructose corn syrup is 55% uh, fructose or more. Agave syrups are 90% fructose or more. And then we have the issue of processed food, which will have the added sugars in there. There's two other activators of this pathway. One of them is salt, uh, three. One of them is salt, one of them is dehydration, and uh, salt, dehydration. Well, I'll think of it later and come back to it. All right, next. So what I wanna do, because we only have 30 minutes, is I'm gonna summarize two things here. The first is the biochemical consequences of the fat switch uh, activation um, or the survival switch. So number one, what you need to keep in mind about this is that 24 million years ago when we evolved this pathway, we were hunter-gatherers and we ate intermittently. So it is hypothesized that the function of this pathway was to allow us when we came onto a food, food source to rapidly and quantitatively be able to put on fat. So when the switch is activated, our, uh, our liver, just to stick with the liver, is completely reprogrammed. The only thing that it's doing is generating, is generating new fat in the form of oil droplets and packaging fat that's going to the adipose tissue. All the other functions are shut down. Relative to type 2 diabetes, the liver is also uh, producing glucose that is being re, uh, released into the circulatory system. This goes back to the whole uh, insulin resistance issue. So we have new fat accumulation, we have glycogen synthesis, we have disruption of the leptin, we have lep leptin resistance, so we have disruption of the satiety and hunger hormones. So people, when they're eating a standard American meal five to six times a day that is hyperglycemic and also has added sugar, they're eating, they're eating more, they don't get uh, the satiety signals, um, and so on. Um, there's insulin resistance. I've already talked a little bit about that. We have an increase in blood pressure. We have significant uh, systemic inflammation that comes back to triggering, triggering the insulin resistance. And then we also downregulate the nitric oxide pathways, which downstream has consequences for cardiovascular disease. Now, the reason why we're all in this room, when the fat switch is activated and it's being done on a chronic level every single time somebody on the standard American diet eating a standard American meal five to six times a day, day after day, week after week, has an increase in hunger. They increase their intake of food. If you sit somebody down at a table and they're eating a ketogenic meal, and next to them is somebody eating a standard American meal, the person eating the standard American meal is going to be hungry longer and they're going to take in more calories than the person eating the ketogenic diet uh, meal who has normalized their hunger and satiety hormones. There is a preference for sugar, but the preference for fructose is greater than the, fruct uh, than the preference for glucose. There's also a preference for fat, but the fat story uh, is, is less worked out th than the preference for sugar. Okay. There's strong signal coordination between the survival switch and the brain. Intermediate to that, we have a strong signals from taste, not only in sweetness, but also in sour, also uh, in umami uh, flavors. Also, there's data that shows that the taste signaling may have something to do with increasing the amount of food that the individual is eating at that moment. Oxidation of these compounds in the liver is, uh, involves also signaling to the brain. So the actual oxidation of the glucose and the processing of the fructose. And then we have the gut, which is significantly more uh, involved because 
The gut also metabolizes fructose, just like in the liver. But we also have nutrient sensing here and so, um, strong signaling associations with the brain. Yeah. Now, th this is a high, highly idealized um, diagram of the brain uh, compared to what we saw earlier today. And I don't even remotely pretend to be lecturing you guys about the brain because my expertise is that biochemical pathway and moving up. But let's just talk about what's going on between activation of the survival switch through taste, through metabolics, and through the gut. In the prefrontal cortex, we have dopamine activation there that is keeping us focused on the plate, the matter at hand, the food that is there. And then if we move down to the nucleus accumbens, uh, this is driving the motor skills, right? We want to just keep shoveling it in. When then we move to the amygdala and it's going, I love this, I love this, I just got to keep motoring on this. And then and we heard about this this morning. I was happy to hear what I heard there because I don't want to be wrong about this necessarily. But this, this particular, the hippocampus, is taking in all that sensory information about what we're doing at that moment, right? This plate of food, the smells, the sights, all that business, so that we can more effectively get back to that environment so, we can re, so that we can uh, repeat this experience. So to summarize this quickly, we have a biochemical preference for glucose and fructose. Fructose is greater than glucose, right? It's significantly greater. Uh, there's a concerted signaling pathway from the, uh, from the survival switch, the fructose metabolism, uh, to the brain. We have a preference for the sugar. The, uh, again, the fructose is greater than the glucose. Uh, and we see dopamine adaptation meaning that after you do this the first time and then you continue with it, uh, the, the dopamine response tends to go down. So you need to, you need to keep going with it to try and achieve the same level of experience. When you, with, when you feed animals doing these experiments, right, and then you withhold the food from them, they demonstrate uh, um, behaviors of withdrawal. And when you give them the drug naloxone, uh, naloxazone, I probably said that wrong, uh, which inhibits, uh, it's the drug that inhibits the opioid system with, with heroin. You see uh, the same thing with uh, opening the format into the symptoms of withdrawal. And lastly, we're, the, the, um, the survival switch drives cravings, overeating, uh, the foraging response, looking for that environment where you can get that food again and then preferences for glucose and fructose. Now I want to finish the science with a quote from Johnson. Basically he says, recall, recall the major action of the survival switch is to increase our cravings, um, our, our level of hunger and the foraging uh, for food. And in his opinion, and I, I agree with this, if we're activating this switch chronically, day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, the potential to develop behavioral disorders like binge eating disorder, um, um, the, the fact that the alcohol is on top of this, there is, there is the potential for the addiction uh, factor. Now, the question is, before I turn this over to my daughter, um, so what I tried to articulate at the beginning, my brain isn't all here right now, um, is the fact that I wanted to talk about the science and then how we apply our understanding of the science to helping our clients. So one of the questions is, uh, does the low-carb lifestyle make sense for addiction? And, uh, and I believe it does because, number one, you're going to eliminate the alcohol and the sugar right out of the gate. That, that's going away immediately. But we also cut into the carbs. And when we do that, we see immediately that glucose is stabilized in these individuals, which means that when the glucose is stabilized, we're also bringing the insulin down, and it's being expressed appropriately. So we eliminate the insulin resistance. 
we increase the satiety factor, right? Because now these hunger and satiety hormones are not being dis dysregulated. So people will satiety, um, they'll reach satiation in a meal earlier, especially in the ketogenic diet because we've elevated fat and we've elevated protein. So people feel like they don't have to eat anymore and they stop eating. Um, the issue of weight gain, some people have um, body image issues that, that are tied into this uh, eating of sugar. And the beauty of the, the low-carb lifestyle is that if they're compliant with the lifestyle, and we're talking a lot about that issue today, but if they're compliant with the lifestyle, they're going to lose approximately 12% of their body weight in the first year on a ketogenic diet. But more importantly, their body composition is really going to improve. So the potential of removing that factor, right, the body imaging factor potentially out of the equation, again, may facilitate uh, the recovery from the addiction more effectively. There's a reduction in risk for CBD, uh, the cardiovascular disease, on the low-carb lifestyle. All cardiovascular markers improve, with the exception of LDL. And any of you guys that follow uh, follow this work perhaps and know of Dave Feldman, then you're going to know that there are studies out that are ongoing right now, just like some of the stuff we heard about earlier relative to addiction. There are, are current studies in regard to the LDL question. And hopefully within a year we'll hear more about whether or not LDL is actually a factor in cardiovascular disease at all. And then this last thing, I wish I'd put it first, this is a really interesting issue here with, uh, with the ketones because if you're on a low-carb lifestyle and you're pro actually producing ketones, specifically beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, these enhance the production of GABA in the brain because they tie into the glutamate-glutamine axis and enhance the production of GABA. So for guys like me who in the late afternoon have the greatest urge to reach for that beer, right, those urges are softened. What has been your greatest challenge staying true to yourself in the keto lifestyle and the effort to reverse your diabetes? Well, hi, Pete, and thank you for, for talking with me today. I've been looking forward to it. But to answer your question, once I truly understood that type 2 diabetes was a carbohydrate sub substance abuse problem, and then in fact, I had an addiction to sugar, the same as alcohol to an alcoholic or drugs to a drug addict, I finally had a diagnosis. So I had hope. And I knew others had battled their addictions in one, and, and I was going to try to give it all I got. I had been told repeatedly by the medical community that it was just the cards I had been dealt. There was not much I could do other than eat less and move more. You know, I, I, I tried countless diets, even tried excessively exercising, walking six and seven miles a day. I walked into work. I mean, um, I wanted so much to eliminate over 20 medications and use and stop using the insulin pump that was hooked to my body because I mean, I, I had to unhook it in the shower I had to swim. If I wanted to swim, I could only go a few minutes. Even if I had to wanted to have sex, I had to worry about that insulin pump and the site. And would it work again? Was I going to have to stick it back in there? Um, was I going to have to pay for another, you know, thing to put it in? And all the medications and doctor's appointments just drained me financially. I felt like giving up. I felt no desire to go out with my friends. Or, you know, pictures were taken at a, an event. I, like, would hide or hide behind somebody. You know, I I couldn't even muster. I had to muster up enough strength just to go to work in the morning and come home. And I would lay down right away. Um, you know, I've been going to diabetic educators um, for years, doing exactly what I was told, measuring um, all my food, counting calories, eating the 46 grams of carbs a meal three times a day, eating two snacks twice a day at 15 grams a piece. I just never wanted to go out to eat. It was just a hassle. It was embarrassing. I had to ask for all these things and measurements and all that. And I just got sicker and sicker. And 
not only that, but my marriage was suffering and I was worried I wasn't going to have any friends left. Um, or worse that I, um, you know, was going to lose a leg or, or not be able to see. Um, and I'm sorry, but I talk about it. It brings all those feelings back up. The low carb, high fat, you know, carnivore changed my life. Tia Reed is officially off of 22 medications. She's our colleague uh, with metformin being the last. When are the urges to eat sugar and carbs the worst? The urges hit the hardest in the evenings or in social situations. Obviously, um, there's a whole bunch of triggers in addition to those. So billboards, uh, memories, anything that uh, the smells that hit, uh, but, but usually the evenings, the afternoons, I find the afternoons are when I struggle the, the biggest with the urges and that's when they start to cement. So if I can keep them from cementing in the afternoons, usually the evenings are much more successful. If they start to cement in my brain and I start to put a plan together, which usually takes a couple seconds. So from the time the urge hits the brain, um, if I take that urge and let it, let it sit, for more than a couple of seconds rather than let it pass through. That's usually when I know I'll have, uh, you know, a binge eating episode that evening. And my binges are four to 5,000 calories, uh, usually highly palatable sugary items. And what type of support works the best to help you overcome the drive to eat carbs? In my situation, the coach relationships paramount, you know, I can't do it. Um, with just leaning on my family, right? My family doesn't necessarily agree with the ketogenic lifestyle. And I need someone that's not only expert in the ketogenic lifestyle, but living it and facing the same challenges that I'm facing. And there's two things that I really need from a coach. One is accountability. I have to have a platform where my numbers are tracked and I can be accountable for my progress or lack thereof. And then the second thing I need from my coach is accessibility. I do need I do need to have some quick response time in the very moment of my struggles. What single thing would you add to your support program that you don't have now? I do feel like these support groups, these anonymous groups where you're you're able to share struggles and successes in a group setting is um a very smart thing that the anonymous groups have come up with that I think we need to see uh, transcend that barrier into the ketogenic lifestyle for those who do need to lean on a support group. And just quickly to show you um, our client, if you can see by his A1C, he came to us two years ago as a type 2 diabetic. Um, in 2020, he was a 6.7. In 2021, he's a 5.8, which brings him down to pre-diabetic range. We are still currently working on the actual addiction recovery aspect, but we're getting there and I'm really proud of him. Um, so this is basically these two videos where the why we do this lifestyle and this is how we do this lifestyle with coaching, with a support group. This is how we do this. So again, we always say keep the carbs low, down the road we go. Um, this is me and my dad in a, a three day backpacking trip in the Grand Canyon, which we did keto the whole entire time. Uh, the hardest part was actually getting out. So again, we want to thank Jen, Heidi, and of course, Bitten. Thank you so much for having us here.